<laughs> My name is Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Ulrich Museum of Art. Um, I'll be brief, but um, for the benefit especially of people um, who didn't hear um, Deborah's earlier speech, I want to make, make sure to introduce her. Um, she's the creator of Lumen, the new sculpture that stands next to Woolsey Hall. She has been active as an artist since the 1970s uh, when she received her both BFA and MFA degrees at the Legendary Art Program at University of California, Davis. She was uh, born in San Diego, California, and horses have been a big part of her life since childhood. It was really fascinating hearing her stories earlier today about all the ways she's been involved with them. And she first, creating, first began creating sculptures in the form of a horse, as she'll point out. <laughs> it's not a horse, but, <laughs> but it resembles a horse to a significant degree. Um, but she began doing that in the 70s and has done it in a wide array of materials, sticks, mud, auto parts, uh, cast bronze, and um, I'm really excited to be able to hear at some length today about her story and path and work. Um, the list of institutions where her work can be found or where it has been exhibited is long and impressive and includes the Seattle Art Museum, Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, Grounds for Sculpture in New Jersey, which is a really renowned uh, space for outdoor sculpture. Um, in it includes institutions in Montana and Hawaii, which are the two states she calls home. And uh, we'll also include next month, I'm told, in a, a Mar Marlboro Gallery, which will start representing her work, and we'll, there will be a show in New York. Um, there's an equally impressive list of collections where her work can be found permanently, just like it can now at the Ulrich, the Art Institute of Chicago, Brooklyn Museum, the Hirschhorn in DC, the Met in New York, Nelson Atkins, um, and SF MoMA, among others. Um, and sort of, to add to this list of accolades, I'm very excited to point out that um, Debbie is, is it okay if I call you Debbie, <laughs> is, the 20, is the 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award for, from the International Sculpture Center, which I think sort of speaks to her significance and prominence in the world of contemporary art and specifically sculpture. So uh, we are extremely grateful to the forces, to the, uh, WSU Foundation and of course the Barton School of Business, the forces behind the construction of Woolsey Hall for making the acquisition of this work possible and for being really wonderful partners in several collaborations that allowed us to place really great works of art around Woolsey Hall. And I think that's all that I need to say and I can hand the mic over. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, they won't turn the lights down. It's much more intimate with the lights dark, but we will do our best. Um, I grew up in San Diego, and the first thing that I saw that I loved was a horse. And I, I couldn't talk yet, and we had these little pony rides in the corners. It was very rural then. So my dad enabled me to go and ride horses. They kind of, it's like I had this horse-shaped hole in my vision and it clicked. And I was born on the day of the Kentucky Derby <laughs> when Ponder won. So uh, this was my horse, Willie. And it was in the days, this was a four by five and we didn't know he was sticking his tongue out until we got it developed. He was very excited to have his portrait taken. <laughs> I uh, went to UC San Diego, uh, then transferred up to UC Davis and got, ended up getting both degrees there. I was a potter and Bob Arneson was my teacher and he said, this is a university, we don't do pots, we only do sculpture. If you wanna do pots, do it on your own time. And of course, I made a lot of pots and that's all that Bob talked about in the reviews. Um, I ended up becoming his teaching assistant and when I graduated, we got drunk on margaritas and cried over this book of Japanese ceramics, <laughs> pots. <laughs> but I was, at this time, I, I think this piece, I was still an undergraduate, and I had been teased about loving horses, drawing horses, you know, once I was in high school. 
And so I was ashamed of my love addiction to horses, and so I repressed it. And then I ended up living for free on a thoroughbred farm outside Davis uh, in exchange for feeding them in the morning. And they let me ride this one mare, and I just decided if I made the saddle, it was like implying the presence of the horse and the rider. And I was a student of, I particularly adored Asian ceramics. And so I decided to make this Western saddle. And then when I was carving it in the leather hard clay, it looked so much like the Sung Dynasty uh, celadons and stuff that I, I couldn't believe it. And then I realized there was some interchange between Mexico and China. But these were life size. I had to make a clay horseback to fire them on. And the stirrups and the leggings were in two different parts. And then at this farm, I, I just was so intrigued by the utilitarian object of a saddle being off duty. You know, what do these things do when we're not around? And the kind of phallic gesture of the saddle horn and then the idea of uh, ancient sculpture being, uh, the form was revealed by the drape concealing it. And so these things were, were what I was thinking about. And, and later on, it turns out, I, did rec I do a lot of reclining horses, and I believe this was like, you know, off-duty, a reclining saddle in a way. And this was a Ming Dynasty pot. I, I didn't allow myself to do fake Chinese ceramics, but I did allow myself to make saddles in the form of the Ming Dynasty. Um, the problem with these saddles was that I couldn't just put them on a sawhorse. I had to actually make appropriate bases for them. And so this was after the Ming Dynasty. With the, I had to carve the horse heads and do all this. And I, my husband, John Buck, is the one who's good at wood, and I am not. I'm terrified of all the table saws. So that kind of... I started veering away, but this is the Northern Sung Dynasty, the incised peony pattern. They put black slip on the clay and then carve it away. And so this was a saddle I made. The last one ended up at MoMA in San Francisco, and this one is at the McNay in Texas. And when I fired it, it cracked, and I was heartbroken. Um, when I did the glaze firing, the clear glaze over it. And then I remembered that the Chinese potters would fill cracks with gold. It was like to say, you know, as we get wrinkled, we have at least wisdom and, some va and more value. So when I did that, the piece just came to life. And then <laughs> this was, I had bought a thoroughbred mare and she tried to buck me off in a cactus patch. And so this was an homage to her. And Bob Arneson said, do you know Lucas Samaras's work? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I didn't. So it became an homage to him. And later I was teaching it in Madison and I invited him as a visiting artist, and I showed him my slides first. And I said, Lucas, this became an homage to you. And he got all, I don't know if you've met Lucas Samaras. He's really a scary guy in a way. And he said, my name means saddle maker in Greek. <laughs> so it ended up being a perfect homage. But it was very fragile. The, the spines were porcelain, and I put them in with silicone, so they could kind of bristle, and then if they broke, I could replace them. But like anything that fragile, it was brittle. And then I got to go to Skowhegan School uh, Painting and Sculpture in Maine in 72. And Wiley, I had these teachers at Davis, William Wiley, Wayne Tebow, Manuel Neri, Robert Arneson, and Roy DeForest. And Wiley was so generous with his own art. Like, I had been an English minor and loved puns, and everybody in San Diego hated when I made a pun. And I came to Davis and William Wiley's work, there'd be this little tiny watercolor and then this long story below it that was a title or a story full of puns. And I'm like, oh my God, I came to the right place. But I couldn't think of how do you, how do you come up with an idea to make a visual thing? And he would say, in drawing class, start with a title and then illustrate it. So I did 
a drawing a bed of leaves. And then when I was Maine, I, in Maine, I actually made a bed of leaves. You know, it was all tied, lashed together, and I made a quilt of leaves and put on it. And it was like, it was in the woods, and the teachers kind of didn't want to critique it because they didn't think it was art, because it was made out of sticks. But I thought, you know, we're born on beds, we make love on beds, we die on them, we're sick in them, we jump on top of them, we hide under them. I just thought it was a piece that was just evocative and almost like a Magritte in the sense that you wander into the forest and is it really there? Um, and then that led to me making a real sculpture with welded steel and chicken wire and plaster. Um, I'm a Taurus and I was this young, I was in love with John Buck and he was married to someone else and oh God, the idea of love and life and un imbalance, uh, these little heifers were next to my studio, these little dairy heifers and I had seen a Boonwell movie with a cow on a bed and I just thought she's standing on the bed as if she's in the back of a pickup truck trying to balance and so it was sort of, the first time I started using the animal form as a kind of metaphorical self-portrait. And I won a sculpture award because it was really sculpture. <laughs> and then John got a, a fellowship in England at the Gloucestershire College of Art and Design and I went with him. And being a California girl, it was very hard for me. Uh, the classism, the sexism was, I wasn't prepared for it. and. Uh, I kind of cried a lot and it rained a lot, and, but I ended up making this piece at the school. It's um, braised stainless steel armature with chicken wire, but it's plumbed so that it's a reindeer and it's raining. I don't know if you can see there's a garden hose going up its left hind leg. <laughs> it, it was inspired by a, a medieval, a drawing of a me medieval pot that they put a pitcher with holes in it that they would fill with water and use to water, you know, young plants. And then I wanted to make horses, and this was during Vietnam War, and kind of the major images you see of horses are war horses. And I had thought um, the Chinese at least had horses that were engaged, like this is a woman, I think, playing polo or something. And I was so drawn to that sensibility and the tongue. And I had a real horse that looked like that, whom you'll see. So these were the first horses I made. They were in my MFA show at UC Davis. And then I made another one, the one on the right. I think I had three at Davis. And it was, they gave me a show at the U University gallery at Berkeley and I wanted them to be atmospheric like a Turner painting so they weighed you know a thousand pounds or something but like you could put your your hand through it like it wasn't really there and it was on the carpet in this gallery in Berkeley and it was a teaching museum and it was very scary because the little girls would come in <laughs> and rush the horses and they had to change the guards about every four hours because we were so afraid they were gonna fall on them. And then um, I got the job in Madison and actually these last pieces came to Zola Lieberman Gallery in 76. Um, John and I drove them on a U-Haul from California <laughs> to Chicago. And then when I was in Madison uh, teaching, I had uh, an opportunity to have a show at the Madison Art Center and made these pieces. I was so sick of these heavy pieces. I relied on other people to move them. And so John convinced me to use paper mache. So it's the same steel and chicken wire armature covered with uh, brown paper and dextrin glue and then a mixture of mud and paper pulp and I don't know leaves and sticks and rabbit shit from our garden. And I wanted to make them, they had no, um, really no eyes or mouths or, you know, they were very generalized. And so I put them in a space that had been lit for printmaking 
And it was almost like they were dancers in this room and the lights were just still on the walls. So many people would not go in the room because you, you had to maneuver in between them. I think it was my most powerful installation. They, they went down with the other ones uh, for a show in Zola Lieberman Gallery and I got a review in our forum, which I was so excited. In the first sentence was Deborah Butterfield's horses have no genitals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't even send it to my parents. <laughs> they don't have eyes either, you know? <laughs> and they were mares. I'm like, well, you would have to lift up the tail. <laughs> so then um, you can feel the swirling energy. And I, I like the work very much inside a, a human space because I feel that the energy is bouncing off the walls and building. It's like ride, I ride dressage and you're operating in a rectangle, somewhat like figure skating, and you get that same feeling of this kind of dynamic tension between you and the wall and the horse's body and breathing. And I, I want people when they experience my work to be able to feel it and understand it almost through their body more than their eyes. This was also at Zola Lieberman. Uh, John got a job at Montana State and I took a leave and moved out there. And I had done well with these big horses and I thought, wow, um, is it only because they're big? And in fact, when I got the show at Berkeley with the plaster horses, the director there, when she was interviewing me, she said, how are these different than Nancy Graves' camels? And I'm like, oh. well, I never have seen them in real life. I've seen a picture this big in Art Forum, black and white. But I said, she's very much investigating these camels from the outside, more like a scientist. And for me, the horses are mares, they're self-portraits. And so really, they're large mammals, but the difference is the intention, the point of view. And she said, yes, <laughs> I will give you a show. So this was one of the pieces I made that was small and we lived by a lodgepole forest. And I was just so fascinated by like our chow chow would run through the woods and you're like, oh, is that a grizzly? <laughs> um, and also thinking of you know, how we personify nature is kind of how horses see too. You, you see shapes and go, oh! and this was reminiscent of the new descending the, the stairs. How can one object imply motion? And these were the reclining ones thinking of uh, how the floods in the spring would come. And I, I felt I went from being kind of the head of sculpture in the graduate department to being a housewife in Montana, and it was hard for me at first. And then I got to teach at MSU, and we ended up sharing a position. But so I made these reclining horses because my horse was living with us there, and it was like a, a, a nude. I thought, I am putting myself on the, in the gallery on the floor naked uh, for the art critic wolf predators to come and um, criticize me. So I made sure that these had a lot of things sticking out. <laughs> no genitals perhaps, but there were some antlers and things in there. A horse can lie down or can sleep standing up, but when they lay down, they're like, well, either they're really sick or they just feel really safe and comfortable. And it's astonishing to me how their bodies deform. They just, the ground pushes them up and they, it's like a pile that you don't even recognize. And I had to take Wayne Tebow's figure drawing class and he would make us plot, he'd make us draw the model in 10 minutes in the corner. And we had a naked lady lying on a plinth. And then he would make you grid out the thing and actually, you know, use your pencil and make dots. And after two hours, he would let you connect the dots. And you have this, it's a reclining new, but it looks more like a mountain range or something. You know, it wasn't, 
it made you actually see what you were looking at, not what you thought you were looking at. And I guess that's what I've been trying to do with the work is, is make the horses not a symbol, but actual something you really engage in. This was at Zola Lieberman in 77. And then, and these big ones, they didn't sell. And I was so depressed. I did, I was able to buy a dishwasher. <laughs> And uh, so they were in storage, and then Roberta Lieberman went to O.K. Harris, uh, uh, Ivan Karp in New York, he was the only guy who would look at slides, and showed him my slides. And he said, I love these. You know, I'll put her in a group show in October. And then I got a call in April, and he said, young lady, would you like to have a one-person show in next month? And I'm like, OK. <laughs> But they were all in storage, and because they hadn't sold, I got to have a show in New York. And then these pieces were, one ended up in the Whitney. I mean, they, it was amazing for me. Um, really started my career. So sometimes the things that you think are the worst things that can happen are the best things. And this was a piece, I was living in Montana, my father had died, and I was asked to create a piece for the Albright Knox Museum. And they said, we can either bring you or the work. <laughs> to, and usually I install the work. So I said, well, um, I had seen a, in the Art Institute a book of a Navajo child sitting in a sand painting with the directions of the universe um, healing her. And I was really close to my dad. And so this piece, I said, I'm, I'm sending you a compass, arrange them north, south, east, and west. And that year was the coldest winter, oh, I don't know, in 30 years. It was 30 below zero every night for three weeks and never got above zero. And I had to make these mud horses. I, I rode my horse down to the woods off of our road and drug, tied him up, broke sticks, drug them out, had him drag them back up the hill. I went to the, the nursery and they let me take a pickaxe to their pile of topsoil. And I was just, I was thinking, God, you know, I wish I could just order these on the art supply store. But then I, I realized it was, you know, losing your parents. It's not, it's painful. It's meant to be painful. And so uh, this was an important piece for me. And they picked it up to go there on the day of a full eclipse of the sun. So it was a powerful memory. I wish I could have seen it. <laughs> and this show was at Hanson Fuller Gallery in San Francisco in 78, and it was on the fifth floor, and we had to lift these in with a crane, and I had all this branches on the floor, and the art dealers were freaking out. But I, I wanted to, this piece was like in a bonfire, or perhaps rays of light coming down from heaven. I wanted to personify physically the kind of, power around the horse to delineate it. And also, instead of making it look like something that the river washed up to make it definitely looked human made, like a, a wiki up or a te uh, teepee. And this was one of my inspirations, Magritte. And these are, I like, got the Oakland Museum and SF MoMA and the DeRosa and are going to be, three of them are going to be next summer at the Minetti Shrem in Davis, so it'll be nice to reunite them. And I'm giving a seminar on mud making at F SF MoMA in their new cons conservation lab. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm giving the Dharma of mud, I'm taking the original bucket of dirt that I used and, and uh, going to do a, a mud recipe demo. And then we moved to our own place in Montana. It was a five acre, little, really ratty place that cleaning up the, the house and the pastures, I made 29 trips to the dump. And I'd been buying rebar to make these armatures. And then I have this little truckload of fencing and I'm like, what? This is really dumb, you know? <laughs> so I started making work out of the debris that I was hauling out of the field. And 
hog wire and all this old fencing. And I threw mud on it because I had kind of made my name by making mud pieces. And then I realized it was like putting frosting on a cake that didn't really need it. So, but I think this piece is at the Art Institute in Chicago. And so the, the pieces became more spare after this. And this one was that, I love this piece. It's, I don't know if you've ever rolled up hog wire. Uh, it wants to explode and cut you and get you in the eyes. And the prudent thing to do is to jam a stick through it so it won't explode. And they say a horse will go back to the wild like in three weeks. And so these are all sticks from a pine tree. And at some point, they're going to, to rot and disintegrate, and the wire is going to explode out of the horse. So I thought it was a wonderful metaphor for domestication. Oh, this is the one at the Art Institute, yeah. They really became, instead of the outward thing, a lot of my friends were getting pregnant, and I, I started thinking, and I was really with horses more, I started thinking more about what's going on inside, so the pieces became almost like a x-ray of a moment in time of an emotion. Um, and then I got a Guggenheim and built a show in the sculpture garden at the Israel Museum using a lot of debris. Uh, I was there for a month working with a guy from a commune and we were, we had just this little stick welder that we had to bribe the museum guy to let us use at the museum. <laughs> it was crazy. This was a piece made out of ladders. They were building a, a, an addition next door. And the, here we are welding this piece and you know, the museum would call and people would be kneeling on that platform to the left. And the, the workers there brought me cups of coffee and it was so lovely and they brought me pieces of rebar and stuff. And this was a, a piece about the fragility of our world and this was in 1980. <laughs> God help us. But I, it was, I found this wonderful rusted netting, and so I put that over this armature and then sandwiched in between two layers these incredibly fragile pieces of rusted metal, kind of looking like continents. And this was my war horse. That's at the contemporary here, actually. They would leave equipment on the side of the road as war memorials. And so this was what I think of war horses. It doesn't work out so well. And then the show uh, went to Germany to Zerner Gallery in Cologne. And even though people didn't know where the work originated from, people would just walk in and start crying. I feel that the energy of the materials somehow retain, is retained within the, the actual molecular structure somehow. But uh, it, it, people were incredibly moved by it without even knowing where it came from. And then this was a show in the early 80s that traveled to 12 museums. And this is a piece, it, this was at the Walker Art Center. And they ended up buying this piece. It was. Um, Oh, it was after like St. Anthony. It was from this, this uh, church in Bozeman that had been bulldozed. And so I went and got the material and, and sprayed fixative on it to keep the brick dust on it. Um, there was well, many pieces in that. I'm gonna kind of rush forward now. And then we were invited in 86, uh, me first and then John in 87 to build a show at the Honolulu Advertiser Gallery that later became the Contemporary Museum in Honolulu. And so I spent three months there with our little son and John and we just worked really hard. Anna welded this stuff out of stuff from the, the dumps, basically roofing that had been through terrible weather in Hawaii. And then John had asked 
Thurston Twigsmith, our benefactor, if he would trade us some land for art. And that night, Roy DeForest and his wife and John and I and Wilder went down to the volcano. It had been threatening eruption for days. And we walked out of a restaurant in Hilo in the dark, but the whole sky was red. And about 15 miles away, the volcano was fountaining like 1,300 feet in the air. And then we drove a little further and I got out. There was a full moon and I just went into the bushes and wanted to hear the volcano and there was a white horse. And I'm like, <laughs> it was like the most spiritual experience of my life. And, uh, and then I said to John, Twig is going to sell us the land and he called the next morning. I just felt like it was a, a blessing from that place. Um, then I came back and I had been, it taken me a long time to get my own junkyard going, but I finally got enough uh, colored metal to start building pieces of color. So this was my first show at Ed Thorpe. And this was a later show, but this kind of would show my, my studio, how things kind of creep up off the floor onto the horse and back. This was Riot. This is Palma. I kind of wanted to see, it was so fun to become really comfortable with the MIG welding and cutting and, and just feel free to erase, you know, to put stuff on, take it back off. And I just wanted to see with these pieces how little I could do to make them right. And this was kind of the opposite. This is a fully armored horse. Um, I dug up this metal from a dump in Gallatin Gateway, and it was cars from the 30s, and it reminded me of a Japanese samurai armor. And it was so amazing. It was virgin American steel. And when you would cut it and weld it, it was like, wow, you felt like you were really good at doing that. And I realized that all the metal we deal with is just scrap, you know, it's been re-melted re so many times. Ikazuki, this was a famous mythical war horse in Japan. And this is the first bronze I made for the Walker Art Center. Mark Anderson from the foundry came out and I had to figure out how to make things that would stay outside. And he said, drive a truckload of sticks to Walla Walla and we'll cast them in bronze. And then you come back and we'll weld it together. And it was really the most fun I ever had. And I couldn't really believe how they can tool the bronze and cast it. So this is in Hawaii. We built, this was my studio. It was just outdoors. And I would ship a bunch of bronze sticks to Hawaii. And Mark came over and we welded armatures. And then here I'm tying passion fruit vines on this piece. I think this ended up at the Kansas City Zoo but then I would have to ship them back to the mainland and then they would do the casting. And this is the bronze. And then this was for the Denver Art Museum, Lucky. I had this horse from Germany who loved to snuggle. The barn cats would lay with him and he would love, to, he liked to have you come and sit with him when he was resting. And they wanted one of the pieces for the kids to be able to climb on and interact with, sort of like Millie out here. And so this was, I thought Lucky is the one who would have really liked it. And this was Argus uh, from the myth with the cowherd with all the eyes. And second daughter and this was Walla Walla. This was a vine that was growing up this tree at the foundry in Walla Walla. And I always felt like the, the wicked witch, you know. <laughs> I, I would pinch it and see if it was dead yet, you know. And Mark finally said, just cut it down. And then the right hind leg is a bougainvillea from Bob Arneson's porch, which I had wished dead for 20 years. And finally it died, and they brought it to me. So. Um, Anyway, this was one of those pieces where we, 
you know, I'm tying the wood onto the armature and I couldn't keep up with it. It was like sometimes the wood just kind of jumps off the floor onto the piece. It was just so much fun to make. And this was a piece, I, it was a commission and I got to use um, manzanita that I collected from the person's house in California. And it was so much fun to work with such an unusual material. And this is my yard, my scrap yard, my pallet in Bozeman. Uh, it's, I get itchy fingers whenever I go out there. And this is um, my steel studio, which also is a tractor barn, depending on what the season is. But, you know, making the piece is so easy and you don't use that much stuff, but you drag in 20 tons of other things so that you can decide what you're going to use. And this was Walt, my assistant. And this one was concrete. It reminded me of molecules. And this I did after 2001, September 11th. I didn't know what to do with myself, so I, I went in and, and worked. I went to the Red Cross and I didn't need blood. Uh, I'm O negative, so I said, well, I'm O negative. She said, everyone in here is O negative, but there was no need for blood, unfortunately. This was called Boogie Woogie, Termondrian. And this was turning its head. And this is um, Hawaii, which is a piece I kept. It reminded me of the reclining nude, and it's like a, an island or a continent or a horse. And this is Monikana. This is in the Smithsonian uh, Museum of American Art. And this was Hawaiian wood. I, I sent it to Walla Walla and made the pieces there. This was fish trap. I, I started going back. This is bronze, but I, you know, when I work, all this stuff is on the floor. And so for some reason, the legs are getting longer and longer. And I feel like, oh my God, there's nothing balancing it out. And so I, I just sort of started leaning these things on it. And it just oh, it felt perfect to me. And this was from a, a fire that we had to evacuate for in Bozeman, the Millie fire. I ended up, I've done quite a few of these pieces. And again, with death, it's so beautiful at the same time. Another piece that was L.A. Louver. And then these are a series of my real horses. These were my two Grand Prix dressage mares, Isabel and Vicky. And they spoke more languages than I did and lived to be in their 20s, almost 30, and were the love of my life. This was Isabel. And I didn't intend to make her portrait, but when I made it, I'm like, oh my God, that's Isabel. This was Hoover, who was the Tong Dynasty horse. And this is Hoover. This was Rex. He was 25 here, but he was an amazing, he was a therapeutic riding horse of the year for the Northwest and second in the whole nation. And we had a, we were on CBS Sunday morning and I, my assistant and I made a saddle with a, a support, a brace, so you could put it under a quadriplegic's arms to support them and, and you know, help them get on with a mounting block. Or you could, um, Rex was a driving horse too, so you could, we had a, a, a wagon that had a wheelchair ramp that would lock in. And so I rode on the side as a safety monitor, but like, uh, you could strap the reins around a person's hands with Velcro, and then we would go booking down Cottonwood Road. And, you know, if you've been in a wheelchair for a long time, it's pretty thrilling to go behind the really big horse very fast. And it was a wonderful thing. And this, this is Rex. He's at the Coral Gables Museum. And this was Ismani. It's hard to look at some of these. And this was Wilfred, Willie. And this was Captain. He was a, a cow horse. 
And I made this piece and I'm like, oh my God, it's Captain. This was Danuta. And Danuta is a young horse and this is her. This is Spotty who's still alive. He just turned 20 and he's doing all the Grand Prix stuff. He was pretty young here. And this is Spotty. I'm using the, the burls in the wood to make his spots. And this is my wonderful mare, Danny, Dancia. And this is her. And this is Red Stick. This is one at Crystal Bridges. This is um, Manzanita as well, or Madrone. And this was a piece at Zola Lieberman that was gigantic. And it's a big gallery. Well, the old gallery was huge. And it had this giant column in it that I always battled with. You put four horses in, three, two. Finally, we did one. It was an oversized one for John Papa John, and it weighed two tons. And my son is... Five, nine, and it was the only thing in there and it made that pillar look like a sapling. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> but it was sort of wonderful to just have one piece in there. You felt like you could really just go in and be with it, like in the woods. And this is part of my studio in Walla Walla. We repurposed an old greenhouse and it's sort of like the Walmart of sticks. <laughs> and there's some sticks that I've had there since, you know, for 20, 30 years. I bring them out to Montana every time I come from Montana. And this shows the investment process of like a little horse. You can see it's sort of facing down. This is, um, they've dipped it in ceramic shell and well, then they'll put it in a kiln and burn the wood out and evacuate the ash. Um, and then they'll heat it up again. And this is Mark Anderson, who's passed away, but started Walla Walla Foundry, my dearest friend. And he's got the bronze ready to pour. And then this shows the parts for a big horse that have been uh, welded, the parts are welded back together and tooled. They still show the, the heat patina and they will be welded back onto the horse and tooled so you don't see the welds and then sandblasted. And here shows that giant horse being worked on in the, the metal shop. It's like an operating table. And here I came back and the thing that's wonderful about the, the process when it's not a multiple is, do you see that that's the head hanging there? I decided that the neck was too long. And so <laughs> we cut the head off and um, ground off the, the neck sticks and bent them to reattach. So we did a, a neck transplant. <laughs> this is bronze, the head weighed about 300 pounds. <laughs> And this is putting the patinas on. This was a piece that went to New York and uh, Madrone. So I use a, a weed burner and generally ferric nitrate and acid and on white paint, um, the, it's a rust in, it's basically rust in acid and it turns things rust color varying from yellow to dark red depending on uh, how dense the formula is and how hot it gets and how, you know, you just, oh, sometimes the patina gods are with you and sometimes they're not. And this shows the installation in New York. It was on the fifth floor or something. And this part was really pretty cool. These are the riggers that did Richard Serra's stuff. But look at, he's like patting the horse. <laughs> it's very, very sweet. This is like the ascension, <laughs> the descension. And this is me next to the, that big horse. I guess it was still in wood. 
on a bronze armature that was you could see on the big table that they were welding. So you can see that we would have steel braces welded onto the bottom so that it would be sturdy enough to make it to be taken apart. <laughs> this was another giant one, indelible, I think. And this shows it being installed <laughs> at the Children's Hospital in Iowa City. And then this is Hawaii, where I work. Um, the difference in, you know, all of my stuff is covered in snow until really, and the roads, you can't get into the forest until June. And so having the opportunity, we've been working there since 86, the, the nature is so different. The woods are hardwoods, and they have a different, I don't know, the geometry. Ferns have these crazy ideas. Plants can do goofy things there and not be punished like they are in Montana. So you see a lot more you know, creativity in the plants in Hawaii. And these were the two feral horses that were on our property and two feral donkeys. Um, they've all passed now, they were ancient. But they turned the donkeys loose. They used to be with the coffee farmers where we live in, the, in Kona. And then the Price Folgers came in, the coffee from South America came in, Central America, and the coffee farmers in Kona all went broke. And so they turned all the donkeys loose because they couldn't feed them. And then they became, you know, invasive. So they rounded them up off the golf courses and brought them up the mountain and turned them up. <laughs> so we ended up with two on our property. But um, they gave me an appreciation so much for donkeys. This shows um, ohia trees. So this is Hawaii at 3,400 feet on a volcano. It's not like what you imagine. But these are air roots that have grown down from a tree that's fallen. And it's just so inspiring. And we live next to a 5,000 acre ranch. And these are tree ferns from a very old lava flow. And they're like 30 feet tall. So you feel like you're in Jurassic Park. And this is another. They kind of walk around at night when you're not looking. But very figurative. And this is my studio in Hawaii. and my model. And this is John helping me get wood. These are koa trees up on the mountain. And a koa tree. And the, I mean, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and this is a tree, a, a tree, a horse using the, the ohia leaves and wood. I ended up becoming a tree worshiper even more than a horse worshiper. And this one was Mark and John helped me go up to the birthplace of Kamehameha on the North Shore. And it was very scary. They had to go down this cliff and they'd throw this stuff up to me. But a lot of this material was from there. And also an ancient canoe that was filled with termite holes that Thurston Twigsmith gave us. So the piece was called Kamehameha, but a lot of it was also from the wreckage of a boat um, in Kona. And my son was, I don't know, 11, wilder. And I get a collect phone call in the middle of the day. He's with the, the babysitter down at the beach. And he says, Mom, we can't swim today. The hurricane uh, wrecked this boat and there's nails. And I'm like, well, Becca can take you to another beach. She says, no, you don't understand. You could make a horse out of this boat. <laughs> I said, well, they won't let us drive onto the pier anymore. They wouldn't let me do it. He said, it's all arranged. I've spoken to the police. <laughs> and they would love you to take as much as you want. <laughs> anyway, so I went down and did that. It was just, it was so wonderful. And it was the sea wife, too. And one of the things we found was the spine of a book, How to Sail a Boat. <laughs> and then the scupper, you know, that was the plug where you would drain the water out. And it was like, oh. And more Hawaiian pieces. And this is the view from my studio 
And we were drawn to the place because of the dead trees. <laughs> And then also I've had the opportunity to work in Iceland for different times at our friend Horse Breeder's studio. She's a sculptor and oh, we were just so blown away by the place. And I wanted to make driftwood horses, but there's not much wood. That's Snifelsness, the glacier and volcano. And this is me on an Icelandic horse. They're so brave, and this is an eider duck on the north end. And this is, I started collecting debris and using it and making things. This is an Icelandic sheepdog, and these were eider down nests and things that they had, you know, had been wrecked. And so I made this horse out of those in Iceland. And then I had a studio assistant with another one, Ananas. And this was at, you know, one in the morning. And this was my suitcase <laughs> going home. <laughs> and I made this piece at home. Uh, and I kept it not cast. I just love it so much. And this too, you might recognize some of those pieces from the suitcase. So these are cast bronze and I, I paint them to look like the wood or the plastic. And it's fun for me, it, it kind of is the combination of the steel pieces and the bronze pieces. And this piece was from Hawaii actually. And then this is Cody, Wyoming, uh, going down to pick up wood there on a reservoir. Some of Lumen's wood is from there as well. I, I drove up to this and I almost had a heart attack. I mean, it was like, uh. And then I, I read an article about these, the bay keepers of Alaska were gathering the debris that had washed up from the tsunami in the islands in Alaska and somehow found that they were trying to bring it all down. I mean, they went on little boats and collected all this stuff, and they brought it down to waste management in Seattle. And for some kerfuffle with the, the county, they weren't allowed to recycle it. They had wanted to put it on a pier and let people come and help them recycle it. And no one was allowed to touch it. And so waste management, they thought, I wanted to make a piece about this, and they thought it was a wonderful idea. So they. They let me sneak in a U-Haul truck, and there was like an eight-foot-tall, you know, dumpster thing. And I, we had crawled in there. It was about 100 degrees, and it was all this rotten seawater. But this was what we got, and we had to throw it into the U-Haul the without anybody seeing us. And it was, um, it was sort of scary, but I don't know if you can see this float. There was a little, like, spruce tree redwood tree growing out of this floating debris. I tried to keep it alive, but I couldn't. So I made this armature and then out of bronze and then made this piece, um, tied the plastic on and left the debris around it. Kind of thinking of the, the mare, the mother earth, the blue plastic reminded me of, you know, the ocean and islands and a wash in a sea of, of misery. And it, Gretel Ehrlich had written this book, Facing the Wave, where she went to Japan after the, the tsunami. And she called it The Three Sorrows and allowed me to use this title, Earthquake, Tsunami, Meltdown. And so this piece is called Three Sorrows. This was in Seattle. And then this was a piece from Hawaii. And then this is Montana, where the Millie fire was. This was, I think all of these were at Sola Lieberman. <laughs> but this was the, the fire and how incredible it was, blackened and yet as if it had been varnished. It was a remarkable thing. But the thing that was cool is that the, the saplings were coming up right next to it. 
And so this shows kind of the process of building. There's the armature that's standing. So it's like I build this, uh, it's like a Vitruvian horse about my size and suspend it from the ceiling and put the cross braces for the hips and the shoulders and then weld the legs down. And then we tie the stuff on and as it develops, then I start to understand kind of who the horse is. And it really doesn't, it's pretty abstract and brutal up to this point. And then it, at this point, I'm like ready to start. This was that giant horse. Um, and that neck probably weighed 200 pounds. <laughs> this was actually welding an armature together, but I add the neck on and then start to realize who the horse is. And this one to New York, this was with the debris. And this is one that's going to Marlboro next month called Bowtie from the Bridge of Fire right in our town. And this was Mark, after Mark Anderson from the foundry. He was a redhead, and I'm like looking at this piece I've made. God, I need a name for a redhead. And I'm like, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, this is, um, I'm sorry, this is um, Milk River. This went to the Kennedy Center. It's in the grove dedicated to John Kennedy. It's a uh, ginkgo forest that they planted. It was so beautiful because I thought the piece, I had made the piece, but I didn't think it was like a public piece. You know, it's sort of like this one, contemplative, internalized. And then, you know, there are these benches there and it's, everything else is all flash, but this was so wonderful. It was a contemplative garden. And this is Lumen. And this is my Mare Danuta, and that's it. We did it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Brian and I, we got here, we can't find words today. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I can't think of words. Uh, anyway, anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh huh. It could. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I mix the mud with ground paper and hog hair and use um, grass hay. So I have the fibers. The hog hair is like from furniture, you know, it's curly and it, it kind of moves. And then I put it, it's like ferro cement, I put it on the chicken wire and the the substrata keeps it from going through the chicken wire, but it grabs the chicken wire. So you push it and it has little grabs, and so it does hold on to it. And the dextrin can be rehydrated, so it, you can spray it with water and it will adhere to new mud. So that's what I'm going to do the demo on. <laughs> mud pies, yeah. Sometimes we do, like, uh, and, it's, and with the bronze, like sometimes the bigger pieces are lighter, like lumen is very heavy because most of it is solid. Anything under about an inch and a half is solid. And so, you know, you have something and it might have a big thing in the butt and you think, well, that's gonna counterbalance it, but it doesn't because it's light. Um, but generally what's interesting is lifting them, you pretty much pick them right where the rider would sit, right? It's interesting, but you, you have to just try. You know, we just lift it off this far. But since I'm building it standing up, if it starts to go goofy while I'm building it, then I know I have to counterbalance it. But that's what so, made it so fun for me because using real wood, the wood that's so interesting is so fragile. It's not, you can't, it's not structural. And so, once it's in bronze, you can use the most old rotten wood and it just needs to last long enough to be invested. And so, and then you can cantilever things, you know, because you couldn't with real wood do that. But since you're welding it, you get to play with gravity. Sorry, you were gonna ask something. Well, one of them, <laughs> one of it is that I, I, 
I have, well now they're down, I'm down to five horses and three mules, but I board another 20 some horses. I have an indoor arena and I ride, I try to ride two horses a day and I care for them in all the, the ups and downs. And I mean, you know, colic surgeries, broken legs, all of this. And so my relationship is, is um, it's not superficial. It's blood and guts kind of relationship and heartbreak and joy, and I show them. Um, but on the other hand, when I said these are not horses, it's, it's basically I'm just using a rectangular canvas that's suspended on four legs, and I'm stuffing it with various things, and then I end up personifying it. But it's more this internal dialogue and the composition. I mean, in a way, I think of them as being very abstract that I don't get tired of and, and going to new places and finding what nature does in those places is so exciting. And, and that the materials, whether it's metal that's been in a bomb explosion or wood that's been in a flood or a fire or a bulldozer, um, I just love matter. I love different kinds of metal, like copper, bronze, steel, lead. They're like different breeds of horses, and you get to play with them, and they all have different strengths and weaknesses and different kind of personalities. And so basically, I really, it all really comes down to the density, the, the volume, the, the weight and measure. I, I love just working with the material. It's the angle of repose, I guess you would say. I made a few pieces out of lily leaves and things, and one of them came back and the people had died and the kids wanted money for it, and it was just really gone. And I felt really bad, but you know, they paid $600 for it 50 years ago. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, cable TV is a lot more than that. So, but I, I understand both sides of it. That's why I started using bronze. I mean, I just got so tired. Every dinner party I would go to, when that show went around, oh, we have one of your pieces. Let's have a party. And I'd go, and the cat had knocked it off the piano. The wire stretched. The wood shrank. And it looked like roadkill. And so I'd spend the whole time in the, the kitchen on the floor with pliers trying to remake something that I didn't really remember what it looked like exactly. And I'm not, my brain does not work that way. I'm a get a bigger hammer person. And so I just realized I can't, it's going to make me crazy if I have to try to doctor all these things. And I'm fortunate enough that the big mud and stick pieces all went to public collections. And they're afraid to move them. And, you know, we drove them down from Montana. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you can, you can move them. I'll, I'll hold them in the trailer if you want to do that. But so that's why I'm going to San Francisco to show them how we can conserve them and how they're not. They were kind of made to flake off here and there, unlike the plaster ones, which couldn't do that. So I was just trying to deal with, you know, people running into the door when they're carrying it into the gallery and stuff like that. <laughs> My first show in New York, well, that worked. I went to O.K. Harris. I spent the whole first day on the sidewalk in the back of the gallery repairing these horses. And these New Yorkers came by and they're like, what is that? Is that, is that a dead moose? Is that dirt? Is that mud? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty entertaining. <laughs> anyway, thank you.